Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Vendo Velocity. I'm joined today by one of our senior account strategists, Holly, um, who is going to be talking to us about all things hazmat restrictions and asking for additional hazmat space from Amazon. And then we'll go into a few things related to Mother's Day planning because we know that is right around the corner here. So without further ado, Holly, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, nice to be here. Yes, I'm glad you're back. I know it's been a couple months since we've had you on. Um, so can you just run through what your role looks like here at Vendo? Um, and then we'll dive into the topic for today, but would like you to introduce yourself, please. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm Holly, uh, as the lady said, a senior account strategist here. So um, I help with, you know, just facilitating a couple of our brands, Amazon business and working with the rest of our team on the Vendo side to, you know, help facilitate their advertising strategy, marketing strategy, um, inventory fulfillment, and, you know, everything else, channel control that comes with the scope of running an Amazon business. And so I'm just one of their like main point of contact, helping facilitate all that strategy um, and working with multiple team members here on the Vendo side, which is one of my favorite parts. So there we go. Yes. Holly works across uh, multiple different categories here as well and has been here. What now over two years, Holly? Wow, that's crazy to think about. Um, time flies in Vendo years, but um, mm-hmm. Holly's been here a couple years with us. And as we've said, um, has elevated herself really quickly here within the, the Vendo team. So excited to have her dive in. Um, but today we're going to be talking about an interesting topic that doesn't apply to all, but applies to a decent amount of sellers and is very important that you understand. So um, that is hazmat restrictions and hazmat space. So if you sell within a hazmat category, first and foremost, you need to make sure that you're complying with hazmat regulations um, and ways in which that you uh, show that your in that your product is hazmat is you need to provide safety data sheets, SDS sheets to Amazon. So this is required for you to be shipping any hazmat FBA inventory in. This is all your hazardous materials. That's what hazmat stands for. Um, So that Amazon recognizes that you've done your due diligence um, to make sure that these products are qualified from a safety perspective. Now, Holly, can you speak about some of the nuances specifically of FBA capacity when it comes to hazmat products? Yeah, definitely. So um, as we know, like last year, Amazon, uh, with your standard storage with an FBA, um, opened up the capacity monitor feature, which is essentially your ability to go in and request an increase for your cubic feet storage um, for those standard like uh, storage types, basically. So that concept is essentially that if you need more storage within standard, oversized things, apparel, things like that, you can go into that module and, you know, calculate exactly what cubic feet increase you would need based off of the volume of your SKUs. Now, if you go into that same like uh, area in Seller Central in, you know, FBA shipments, and you go into aerosol or flammable, you'll see that that capacity monitor doesn't exist there. And that's because, you know, with the safety aspect of those types of products and the limited amount of space that they have within their hazardous storage uh, facilities, what Amazon does is basically just controls a little bit more strictly how much storage they're giving out to certain sellers. And you essentially have to make a pitch to them of why you would need that special storage type, depending on your item, your business, the velocity you expect to bring, et cetera. Absolutely. So as Holly's saying, you'd work directly with this dangerous goods team, or Mm -hmm. it's very hard to access them directly, but somebody at Amazon can help facilitate that conversation for you directly with the internal dangerous goods team. So if you, for example, need additional hazmat space and holly's going to speak about some of the calculations that we would do um, in order to get there in a second but that that request will be routed to the dangerous goods teams they'll they're going to review that and understand if the hazmat space you currently have 
for both aerosol or flammable, whichever your product falls under, is ample as it stands, or if they believe, based on your sell-through, et cetera, that you need additional space. So, Holly, talk a little bit about this planning specifically. At what point do you go and request this space? And um, how do you form a good argument um, or proposal to the dangerous goods teams to fight for this space? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's two, I think, different ways you can go about it. The one that worked for me that I was fortunate enough with is that uh, the brand I was working with was able to also send via FBM and, you know, have that open to us. So essentially what that allowed for us to showcase was that uh, you know, the difference within our sales, our conversion rates, our sessions, et cetera, when we had FBA storage available versus FBM for certain items. Um, so that was one like really big one. And then, but if you don't have that, if you're just working off of FBA storage and you're limited in that aspect, then um, sometimes what you can do is really just showcase um, just business plan outside of it, things like that. Now, if you want to take a step back as well in terms of just like how you would calculate exactly your cubic feet that you would need, essentially what you can do is calculate off of your sell-through rate, right? Like your current sell-through rate in Amazon, which we know is becoming more and more uh, important to track with low inventory fees and things like that as well. Um, so once you calculate that, then you want to understand what your length, width, and height dimensions are for the product because essentially what you're going to do is the calculation for volume and then to cubic feet. And once you kind of map that out and you have your list of items that you want to be flowing into FBA, you could then map out how you can continue to fill off of a 45 to 60 day sell through rate based off of what Amazon has. Now, if you think that you're meeting your current sell-through rate perspective, but you believe that you are going to do more than that, like you want to grow beyond that, um, essentially what I've seen work in the past as well, um, and this is super helpful if you have a SaaS core rep on your side to actually go to the dangerous goods team, is because they can then put in the business plan and the business pitch of like what you're expecting to invest into the Amazon business moving forward, which is essentially going to be the pitch of how much you're expecting to grow on Amazon's platform and why you would need more than like your current maxed out space now. Delaney, do you think anything I need to add there? Yeah, Holly, I think that's all great context. Can you expand on the fact that we know that when asking for additional space, when you're looking at, let's say, the standard size storage bucket, you're going to pay this reservation fee up front. When you worked with the SaaS manager, was there the same reservation fee for reserving additional hazmat space? Is that something brands should be worried about? Or is it just the fact that, hey, you got the space, if you don't use it, you might lose it. Um, and that's the only thing that you need to be more cognizant of. Yeah, yeah. So it's mostly that second one where it's just like the, if you get the space and you have that rewarded to you, then it's up to you to use it. There's no uh, extra fee that comes with that. Now, to circle back to the fact that there's not a lot of hazmat storage facilities within Amazon scope available, what you want to be cognizant of is when you're coming up on peak high velocity events for your brand, especially if it's peak velocity events that are in line with what Amazon's entire scope is going to be working on prime day fall prime day black friday cyber monday because as what you'll start finding is that uh you'll start placing those po's for those units and especially if they're larger po's than you normally would do or just large po's in general sometimes amazon will come back and say that there are no uh, hazardous FCs available to receive those units at this time. And you start getting denied a little bit more frequently because, you know, they're trying to intake so much inventory at once. So the, the earlier you can plan to try to like flow in that inventory so that it's there at the time of the peak event, the better, because if you start waiting a little bit closer 
to those events like you would for standard storage. You just might run into too many issues and then your inventory wouldn't land in time. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's something we're looking at across the board now. As Holly said, just within the last couple months, she's been able to get this increase granted, which has positioned her well for Prime Day. And looking at a couple of the other brands that we have, all of these conversations need to be happening right now. Um, because as Holly said, the space that is very limited. So if you're requesting this in June, it's too late. We know mm -hmm. that the FBA inventory deadline to send an inventory is going to be around mid-June. Really, you should aim for mid-May um, if you're being um, careful in terms of allowing yourself enough time for any LTL shipments to actually make it to Amazon for Prime Day. But that's just something to think about. And just building on what Holly said also in creating this argument, you want to clearly lay out, hey, these are the total number of units that we've sold through in the last 30 days and in the last 60 days, you'll see that right now our sell through only covers X days of supply. So with an upcoming event like Prime Day, we're and this limited supply, we're not going to be able to meet customer demand. That's the most important part is how does your current sell through compared to customer demand? And then on top of that, with Amazon's low inventory fees that they're implementing, which we know got waived for this month, hazmat storage is still, still susceptible to these low inventory fees. So we saw for a couple brands um, that had little space and didn't have enough space specifically for hazmat that they're currently incurring these uh, low inventory fees, which we know they're getting credited for, but we are also pushing the dangerous goods teams that this needs to be resolved prior to May 1st, when we will indeed start to get charged for this. So another important thing is talk about how it's impacting your overall PL because of the fact that you're not able to uh, actually meet the customer demand. But Holly, I didn't know if you had anything else to add on the hazmat topic here in terms of requesting space or monitoring uh, capacity throughout uh, the, even when you get granted that additional space, how do you know that's enough and how do you continue to monitor this? Yeah. So, I mean, to emphasize Delaney's point, the biggest thing you could do with Amazon is emphasize the fact that you're trying to meet customer demand, right? And so something else that worked for me as well was with the investment piece of it of saying that, you know, we would be willing to direct traffic to Amazon. Um, they love that. That's always like a really big green flag of being able to allow you more space and allow you to keep continue to scale your Amazon business through that. So I do think that that meeting customer demand and having that be a core part of your argument is really uh, key there. And then in terms of just uh, what was the second part of your question, Delaney? It was when you have that space granted to you already. Ah. Yeah. How do you continue to monitor it? How do you know that that's enough? Like when you ask exactly. for the additional space, are you asking for 60, 90 days of supply? Are you being a little bit heavier there? Or how does how does that um, impact your initial request? Yeah. So what you want to be cognizant of like, what, uh, is not requesting too much. Uh, most of the time with the dangerous goods team, it's if your request is put in and you get denied, they don't want you to put in another request for another like three to six months even. And most of the time they will emphasize like a six month wait between requests. And that's just because of the fact that they're only a lot, you know, they only allow so much, they only have so much room, et cetera. So you want to make sure that your initial request is within a reasonable scope of being able to continue with just 30 to 45 days of sell through off of your main catalog that you'll be working with. Now, obviously, of course, like, you know, if you start scaling beyond that and you start seeing that momentum beyond that, you want to be able to have like 60 to 90 days of supply and just allow that to be open to you. Um, I would say that that's a little bit more dependent on if you have a SAS core rep who's like really going to bat with you with the dangerous goods team and, uh, you know, being able to put in that good word to kind of justify a larger increase like that otherwise what i would continue monitoring like let's say if you only got you know a, a portion of the increase that you really wanted is just keeping a really close eye then on your sell-through rate 
um, with the inventory that you have in there based off of the cubic feet. And then just continuing to map that out as your sell through rate gets beyond what was the initial sell through rate at the time of your request. Right. So like once you start like going beyond that and like expanding beyond that sell through rate afterwards, then you have another business case for the next increased request pitch. And hopefully, especially if you're working directly with Amazon, you'll be able to put that in sooner rather than later if you start, you know, going above and beyond what you had initially requested for. Absolutely. That's a great point and one in which we'll end on. So thank you, Holly, for um, that comprehensive summary. Hopefully that's helpful. But again, if you have any questions related to hazmat inventory, feel free to please reach out to us. Um, we want to quickly talk about Mother's Day because Mother's Day is approaching. It's on May 12th. Um, and what we've already started to see is an increase in traffic, of course, for Mother's Day related gifts. So the search term Mother's Day gifts currently has a search frequency rank on Amazon at number 13, which means that on all of Amazon for last week specifically, it was the 13th most searched term. Um, you also have a few other terms that are a bit more long tail after that, like Mother's Day gifts for mom, Mother's Day cards, Mother's Day decorations. These are all things that, as you can see, if your product specifically fits within this niche, um, or is specific to a Mother's Day gifting um, product, then something that you're probably going to want to participate in with Amazon and also prepare for. Um, so Holly, speak a little bit about this because we know that people probably should have been preparing for this a couple of weeks ago, but how could they continue to prepare for this? What are some things that as sellers um, we should be doing to optimize if our product makes sense for Mother's Day. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what Delaney just called out was pretty much perfect, right? I mean, all the Mother's Day gift search terms are like going up in search frequency velocity, right? So essentially what you want to try to do, especially if your product is applicable for it, is start indexing for those terms, right? So try to embed it into like your title, your bullet points, uh, maybe add it to the Q&A feature of your A plus content, things like that. So it starts really coming up in terms of frequency and tracking your overall ranking on those keywords. And then um, what we you can also do right now is start, uh, you know, ad campaign tests of keyword exact match keyword targeting across all of those different Mother's Day keywords using some of your best and most applicable items for that, seeing if you can start kind of looking at and targeting against those. And then maybe even uh, looking into what other competitors you could be targeting against as well, like looking into just some of the applicable products that are already ranking on Mother's Day gift and Mother's Day uh, key re like related keywords, and then seeing if you can put yourself within that traffic. Something else, of course, if you're willing to do it is uh, discounting so that you play within Amazon's algorithm, um, you know, any sort of deals, whether that's lightning deals, PEDs, coupons, etc., cetera, um, that you're willing to help drive traffic with would be really great. And then if you've done enough pre-planning, which I know that this is something a lot of uh, our brands at Vendo are doing, is specific uh, brand store optimizations and headline search ad creatives that are applicable to Mother's Day and then starting those uh, campaigns as well. Absolutely. Uh, Holly summarized it perfectly there. The only one thing that I'll add, and this is specific to some of the brands that we manage here as an agency, is to understand your D2C strategy as well and any other strategy that you have with other retailers off platform. Um, a lot of the time when we go and ask our brands what they're running on D2C, sometimes they're running a longer promotion or they're doing a full revamp of their site. So that ties in really well to what Holly just spoke about in terms of, yes, brand store optimizations are definitely going to be important and also carrying across that same messaging that you have on D2C during that time is going to be equally important. That way you keep um, the same um, brand presence across both D2C, Amazon, and any other retailer you sell across so that it has that brand feel. Um, but Holly put it perfectly there, so I won't touch on that too much. But if you haven't already started planning for Mother's Day, again, it's not too late. I'm sure that within the next couple of weeks, we'll start to see that 13 search frequency rank come in the top eight 
or so, um, as it always does for some of these peak periods. And then, of course, we'll have Father's Day, we'll have Prime mm -hmm. Day, etc. cetera. Um, so, Holly, just while we're uh, not leaving out the fathers in this, let's talk about that briefly because I think yeah. for Father's Day, it's a bit different just because it comes so close to Prime Day. So what is your recommendation overall for brands that maybe are a better fit for Father's Day when it comes to price count, price, pricing, discounting, et cetera? Does your rationale change there? Yeah, a little bit. And what I will add as well to the um, our point of it, that it's not too late for anything like within Amazon is always take advantage of the two day shipping, one day shipping on Amazon, right? Like when your G to C expires in terms of just being able to ship on time for an event, you see that peak then come back up for Amazon within the last like, you know, last minute shoppers and things like that. So it's always a great thing to just um, have in the back of your head of last minute week before type of strategies for any sort of event like this with Mother's Day. Now with Father's Day to Delaney's point of the fact that it's coming up within Prime Day's time, what you want to be really cognizant of is your last 30 day average selling price. Um, because what Amazon is going to do off of the discounts that you're going to use for Prime Day is discount off of the last 30 day selling price, not your MSRP. So you want to always be really cognizant of your margins and how much you're able to discount off of that. So that if you're running a 20% off discount off on Prime Day, and then you did a 10 or 15% off discount for Father's Day, then all of a sudden you're going into all, you know 25, maybe even 30% discount off of your true MSRP. So it's really just like something to keep in mind with your margins. What we usually recommend is either no discounting or if anything, just do something where it's like a five to 10% off coupon. It wouldn't be too like impactful to your overall um, you know, margins there. And then you're still able to do things for Prime Day. And then what I usually recommend with that, if we're not going to go heavy discount, go heavy off of brand deal, you know, right? Like go and do it with like the brand store, the headline search ads, uh, convene if you're even willing to like direct traffic uh, directly to Amazon. Um, that could always give you a boost in that, the sessions and conversion there. Um, and then all of the other things that I mentioned for Mother's Day in terms of keyword targeting, uh, competitor targeting, things like that. Yep. Those are all great points. Um, and as we had talked about, we're already probably going to see Father's Day traffic start to increase um, right after Mother's Day. So um, if you felt like you uh, were a little behind the eight ball for Mother's Day planning, then it's definitely not too late to build your Father's Day strategy here. And Holly made a great point that I want to hone in on for just a second on the fact that uh, the two day shipping unlock is huge and same day shipping. We've seen in the past that on the day of some of these uh, larger events, if the product is over $25, you can oftentimes get your item um, between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. of that same day. So something that you might want to think about from a pricing standpoint as well is if you're right on the cusp of that $25 price point, maybe you're just below it, then increasing that a bit um, during that period in which you're going to be pushing a Mother's Day or Father's Day sale might be worth it, one, for margin, but also due to the fact that you'll unlock that same day shipping. Um, so just another thing to, to be thinking about there. Um, but Holly, thank you so much for joining us here. I'm sure we'll have you on after the Prime Day period just so we can go through some results, see how that fared for some of your brands. But anything else to uh, leave the audience with as far as parting words and advice um, leading up to some of the most seasonal time periods on Amazon? Uh, no, I think we pretty much covered it. And I will say like, I loved your point about like, just making sure you have a cohesive plan across all of your different marketplaces. I think as a consumer myself, it's always something I love seeing in terms of just that brand parity across pretty much everything in that brand feel. Um, and it really does matter and resonate with a lot of us in terms of just like, we choose where we want to shop, but we know like we've seen you everywhere, right? So kind of have that like in the back of your mind. And as you plan out everything for the rest of the year, you know, just understand that uh, Amazon is definitely important in terms of that like marketing and brand store, brand feel thing. So, um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, I think that that pretty much covers it. There Thanks we go. 
<laughs> well, if you want, would like to reach out to Holly or myself, you can find us at Delaney at VendoCommerce.com or Holly at VendoCommerce.com. But uh, happy planning, everyone, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye, everyone.